five. People across the continent feel enormous empathy for families torn apart, wrenched overnight from lives just like ours. Four. I don't think we're going to see a no-fly zone, but in terms of the commercial conflict, this is full contact. It may be the beginning of the end for Putin, but the end may be a very, very long time coming. You'd be gratified to know, co-pilot, that Velma has been reading defence websites about fixed-wing aircraft. Velma on tour. One. We have lift off. Welcome to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Well, Alison, as the military conflict between Russia and Ukraine escalates, there's also an economic war between Russia and the West. Since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine last Monday, Western governments have been ratcheting up the sanctions. And now in a bid to put pressure on Putin and protect their own reputations, Western companies are now rushing out of Russia too. Energy giants like BP and Shell have vowed to sell their multi-billion pound stakes in various Russian energy projects. US oil major Exxon has just joined them. The likes of Ford, Boeing, Daimler, as well as media thoroughbreds like Warner Brothers, Disney and Sony and tech giants Apple and Dell are also now rushing out of Russia. Events are moving fast, co-pilot, and while we're rightly focused on the military aspects of what's happening in Ukraine and, of course, the humanitarian fallout... It's important, I think, to keep an eye on the big picture. What do these seismic events in post-communist Europe mean for firms and households here in the UK? What do they mean for me, Alison, for you and for our fellow Planet Normal citizens? Well, those are all good questions, Liam. We thought we'd begin this week. A junior medic who is living in the centre of the Ukrainian capital got in touch with Planet Normal. And with the sirens going off, with the threat of bombing... This is what this junior doctor who works delivering babies said to us. Hello, my name is Serhi, and I want to share what is happening right now in Kiev on the 2nd of March. So, so far this um, this night was calmer than the previous ones. At least we could spend uh, several hours in the apartment and sleep here, not in, not in the parking lot and, and in the underground, because this is the only shelter that we can reach. And within a few minutes, um, there are less shootings, but what I'm quite afraid of that these shootings and the explosions that are closer to us. And if you listen attentively right now, there's another soon starting. My parents are really terrified because they are in Lviv in the western part of Ukraine and they really want um, my, my wife and me to get to them, not to stay in Kyiv because they say there is nothing to do here. But... I mean, I'm a doctor and I will have a shift in two days. And that means that I will have to take care of the pregnant women, even if they will have to deliver in salaries. And uh, even if um, the first thing they see, it's pretty much darkness of the underground. But this is safety. This is only safety we can afford right now. Luckily, there are no shootings that are happening here during um, during the day or so close that we can actually see them. But um, this do- doesn't comfort at all because people don't know what to expect. Um, we really fear that there will be two countries with us in this state of war, but not the special operation that will be we have a bombing here that will be blockage. And the, the food that we have in our kitchen now, this will be everything we'll have for week or two or a month we don't know and um it's uniting the nation but it's the price we have to pay that it's really really bad alison i must say that's incredibly powerful even for somebody of my generation i was born in the late 60s that sound is just so evocative isn't so it evocative. it makes yeah. british people literally well up because it reminds us of the blitz And I think also, Liam, that amidst all this chaos and sound and fury of war, that's an ordinary professional person, someone just like us, whose life has been absolutely overturned. This is the eighth day of fighting today as the Planet Normal podcast goes out. And there is a young doctor who is having to take his life in his hands to get to the hospital. And I was particularly struck, as I'm sure most women would be, 
by the idea that he's going to have to deliver babies. There are still babies. Imagine, Liam, babies coming into this world in darkness of an underground basement or car park. And that's the first glimpse they get of this bloody world. I think it really does bring it home to you. This is, for me, what I've been thinking about this week, is it's not, as Neville Chamberlain infamously said of Czechoslovakia in 1938, this is not some quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. I think this is Ukraine. These people, they have lives like ours. They look like us. They talk like us. And I think that this is what's been coming home to people this week. I looked it up, actually, co-pilot. Wars when the invaded country is a democracy hardly ever happen. So this is a huge shock. And British people, people across the continent feel enormous empathy for families torn apart, wrenched overnight from lives just like ours. Fathers we've seen waving goodbye to little kids on trains, knowing they may not see their children again for months, maybe never see them again. And of course, these scenes are playing out 24-7 on phones, on TVs, tablets, radios. And that's having a very powerful effect, Liam, isn't it, on public opinion, stiffening the West resolve to punish Russia in an unprecedented way, which I know you'll talk to us about. But I'm not quite sure the public has realised the price we are going to have to pay for this extreme action. Your comparison with Chamberlain in 38 is really interesting, sparked not just by the sound of the sirens, which actually have moved me, Alison. I'm sort of struggling to hold it together here a little bit. The difference between Ukraine in 2021 and Czechoslovakia in 1938 isn't that the countries are particularly different. They're both Slavic nations that are roughly the same distance away from the UK. The difference now is that this is pretty much the first social media war Ukraine is a tech-savvy country, lots of computer engineers. They have all the same pretty much smartphone apps that we have. Smartphone usage isn't as widespread. It's a much, much poorer country. But many people do have smartphones, particularly in the urban areas where Vladimir Putin has centered his bombing campaign and his military presence. So because this is a social media war, we can do things like we just did, a recording with a young doctor from Kiev almost in real time. That would have been very difficult in 1938 because this is 2022. We can see the tweets and Facebook posts or other forms of social media, TV crews working in Ukraine. It's much, much easier for them to get the pictures back given digital technology. And I genuinely believe, Alison, and as you know, I've covered Russia and Eastern Europe for a long time. I'm genuinely surprised at the extent of Vladimir Putin's overreach. And I'm following the Russian media, Russian newspapers, Russian websites. There is, believe it or not, still a lot of independent journalism going on in Russia and a lot of independent social media messages out there. And we're seeing not just from Russian emigres, but also from the Russian people themselves, particularly younger people, the concern that they have about this war. I don't think young Russian conscripts want to fight this war against their Ukrainian cousins. These countries are literally cousins in so many ways in terms of their blood, their ethnicity and their history. Yes, of course, there are differences. There are differences between different parts of the UK, of course, but there is a huge affinity between these countries, which until quite recently in our adult lifetimes were one country. They were part of the Soviet Union and that was not a coincidence. And the Russian Orthodox Church was created. It had its wellspring in Kiev. There are obviously many ethnic Russians in East Ukraine, but they are quite different from the Ukrainians who live in West Ukraine, who are Catholic rather than Russian Orthodox and much more of Polish origin. They're all Slavs, but they're different. And that's where a lot of this conflict and struggle stems from, that essential difference between the two parts of Ukraine. There have been tensions between the two parts for many years, and there have been tensions between Russia and the West over the future direction of Ukraine for many, many years, allied to that much bigger existential issue of NATO expansion. But crikey, how these tensions have exploded with that aggressive act by Putin. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Liam, that 
as you say, Putin's overreach. I mean, I think the evidence suggests that he was expecting this to be a walk in the park. By accident, Russian state media posted a pre-written release which basically said, we won, a new world is being born before our eyes. And we can only imagine how Putin is feeling now, frustrated, angry, looking for a scapegoat. That's a very, very complex picture. Of course, this vast humanitarian crisis, over 850,000 people have fled over the borders into Poland, Estonia, Moldova, which itself is a you know, very, very poor country. And I think we've all been cheering Ukrainians on, haven't we, Liam? They've put up this amazingly spirited and defiant defence. I'm not sure in my heart that Britain could rally a blitz spirit anymore. But boy, can the Ukrainians, with the sirens going off, rally this extraordinary blitz spirit under President Zelensky, who has shown incredible statesmanship And we get a lot of incredibly positive stories, individual acts of bravery, Ukrainian soldier basically detonating a bomb on a bridge, killing himself just to hold up the Russian tanks just for a few minutes. The Kiev football team, Dynamo Kiev, fantastic football team. We've seen all of those guys going and, you know, putting on military uniform, incredibly stirring sight. You'll love this co-pilot. I think my favourite statement of the week so far comes from the Ukraine Library Association, <laughs> which announcing that they were cancelling their forthcoming conference said, we will reschedule just as soon as we have finished vanquishing our invader. God bless normal people, grandmothers, librarians out there being given weapons, And people are cheering them on, but they are the underdog, Liam. And I think that something that's really troubling me now is that this is not a Hollywood version. This is brutal rare politique. You'll be gratified to know, co-pilot, that Velma has been reading defence websites about fixed-wing aircraft. Velma on (laughs) saw. Velma goes to the Ukraine. Russia is so far superior in artillery. And thus far, it does look like Putin has not chosen to unleash the dogs of war. Still, there are about 2,000 Ukrainians have been killed, including 16 children. Incredibly distressing, but nowhere near the numbers of dead that we will see if the Russians decide to do to Kiev what they did to Grozny and Aleppo. In Chechnya and Syria, respectively. Yeah, but I'm going to ask you, they're going a bit tentatively, aren't they? Do you think that Putin realises that mass civilian casualties could tip things over? What's your sense? I know you've picked out that a lot of the young Russian conscripts in particular are kind of crying. They didn't know that they were going to have to go and kill basically fellow Slavs. What do you think? Do you think that Putin is playing a bit cautiously? I mean, they could basically knock the hell out of Ukraine in 48 hours, couldn't they? By pressing a few buttons, and I'm not talking about nuclear buttons, let's not go there. Conventional weapons, the Russian military is a very powerful organization, more than a million people strong. This is one of the major defense powers of the world, aside from being obviously one of the two true nuclear superpowers. Look, under normal circumstances, Alison, You could sit down with a bunch of academics from across the world, including from the US and the UK, and certainly from across Asia, and you could have a detailed discussion about the various grievances of the Russians and the Ukrainians against each other, the way the West has acted in recent years, particularly in Ukraine. And you could have a very reasonable, responsible conversation about the fact that both sides have got a valuable and important point of view. But those discussions are just now impossible. They would sound ridiculous because the Russians have made such an aggressive move on such a smaller country. It's impossible now to have any kind of discussion that isn't just, this is crazy, Putin must be stopped. And that's what happens when a big power moves so aggressively against a smaller power. And that's where we are. And I think the extent of public opinion in Russia, which does find ways of expressing itself. I've got family literally in Russia over recent weeks and months. One of my kids lives in Moscow. She's at university there, if I may say so. And there are lots of demonstrations on the street. There are lots of demonstrations in St. Petersburg. And they've been crushed by the police in short order. They've been allowed to happen to some extent, but not to any huge 
degree. And I think what Putin has underestimated, as well as Russian public opinion, is the response of the West, which yeah. has been very strong in terms of the economic sanctions. There have actually been sanctions on Russia by the US and the EU and the UK separately since 2014, Alison, but you'd barely notice them because they were pretty light touch. But since then, wow, for the Swiss to be imposing <laughs> sanctions going against all historic precedent, for the world's central banks or the Western central banks to be basically sanctioning the Russian central bank, which owns, as you've indicated, hundreds of billions of dollars of rubles, of pounds, of euros. They can't access that cash to prop up their own currency. That means as the currency falls and the Russian stock market falls, the savings of ordinary men and women, ordinary Russians, households and businesses are being vaporized as we speak. That will put enormous pressure on the Russian government, not least Vladimir Putin. That takes Russian people back to the bad old days of the 90s when I lived there, spent many years there, endless currency collapses as the country, the superpower, the Soviet Union was dismantled and people were literally struggling. Russia's come so far since then in terms of the standard of living its people have, or at least they thought it had. Now they're seeing their savings vaporized. The way we're seeing now businesses moving, BP, Shell, they're saying that they're going to sell multi-billion pound stakes. Shell owns a chunk of the Nord Stream pipeline and part of a huge gas project in Russia's Far East, something called Sakhalin, an absolutely massive asset. BP owns a fifth of Russia's biggest oil company. This is huge stuff. Boeing, Ford have had business interests in Russia that date back to the Soviet Union. They have many production facilities there, as do the likes of Unilever, Procter & Gamble, as do even Daimler. Marks & Spencer's has many branches across Russia. All these businesses now are either saying publicly they're going to sever their links with Russia or at least suspend their links with Russia or are thinking of doing so. And this combination of both government sanctions and business opprobrium is really going to hit Russia. I'm astonished that companies like Maersk and a Swiss company called MSC and the Ocean Network Express, which is based in Singapore. These are the world's biggest freight shipping companies. They make global trade happen. They are the sort of red blood corpuscles, if you like, of global trade. Without those things moving, economies completely stagnate and people suffer. Well, these big shipping lines, Alison, They've said they will not handle freight going into and out of Russia. That's astonishing. We're talking about the world's biggest wheat exporter. We're talking about a company that imports huge amounts of consumer goods from the Western world, 150 million people. This is major economic war. I don't think we're going to see boots on the ground from the West in Ukraine. I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think we're going to see a no-fly zone. But in terms of the commercial conflict... This is full contact. You mentioned, Liam, the Nord Stream pipeline. Something we have talked about before on Planet Normal is the crazy overdependency of the West, and particularly, obviously, Europe, on Russian gas. And in the first couple of days of the war, we saw some of our European neighbours being a bit shamefaced and not exactly wanting to sign up to some of the more stringent sanctions that Boris was very uh, vehemently arguing for. I mean, the Italians, I think, were a bit worried about losing their luxury handbags market in Moscow, always a consideration when children are being murdered. And Germany, indeed. I mean, this I was really quite shocked by this. So the UK has been helping the Ukrainian forces since January with training and with large amounts of anti-tank weapons. I think we can feel proud as a nation that our military has been doing such an enormous amount to help. But we actually saw Germany for the first few days not allowing the United Kingdom to fly weapons to Ukraine through its airspace. And in fact, Germany initially was prepared to give Ukraine 5,000 helmets and they wouldn't even deliver them to Ukraine. They delivered them via Liechtenstein. Let's pause for a moment to absorb the cowardice of that co-pilot. But this is fascinating now because we've talked on Planet Normal 
about the effect of net zero committing to these green renewables, about the effect it's going to have on our cost of living. We've had numerous emails this week, which we'll read later, from people talking about gas bills. But now we're seeing the crazy switch to these things, crazy over-reliance on Russian gas has actually constrained the West initially from having a proper response. And I think people now are looking back at Angela Merkel, once seen as the reassuring mutti of the EU, now in retrospect looks like the Kremlin's best friend. And another thing I found out this week, Liam, I know you won't be shocked by this because you know all about this, but Russia has been spending $95 million giving that to NGOs who are campaigning against fracking and shale gas. Now, that's come from the Centre for European Studies. So those useful idiots have basically undermined our chances of becoming self-sufficient in energy and then at the whim of Vladimir Putin. And I think that's, you know, absolutely disgraceful, although... I do agree that the Western powers, NATO particularly, has redeemed itself with these very, very stringent sanctions. And let's just pause for a moment to say that our beleaguered prime minister, well, Partygate and so on is looking pretty small. Well, I was going to say small beer, but small glass of Prosecco, isn't it? Compared to this, and it was Boris who was leading the charge, wanting Russia to be kicked out of SWIFT when he has been front and centre, leading the calls for tough sanctions. He seems to have rediscovered his Churchillian spine. And I think he's been particularly in contact with President Zelensky. There are so many factors, but I think what we're looking at going forward, Copilot, is huge shift in energy policy and bloody well stop running down our defence. Just imagine a Conservative government until this week wanted to cut our troop numbers from a measly 80,000 to 60,000. So it's about turn, quick march from that. This could turn out to be Boris Johnson's Falklands, if you like. Of course, the war in the early 1980s that rescued Margaret Thatcher from a pretty difficult situation in terms of her own personal unpopularity. She then could have what you'd call a khaki election and she went on to win another term, of course, not just in 83, but also in 87. And the rest, as they say, is history. You're right, Alison, the impact of all this on domestic British politics and indeed society, as well as our cost of living, is absolutely enormous. The media has been reluctant or rightly focused on the military and humanitarian implications of what's happening in Ukraine, so they haven't focused on the implications for the UK. But I do think now there's going to be an end of the moratorium on fracking. I do think we're going to end up developing shale gas in the UK. I do think the government is going to have to move in the upcoming budget on the 23rd of March or the spring statement, as we must call it, to not only dampen the implications of spiralling energy prices for households. We've got that big increase coming in April. And since then, wholesale oil and gas prices have ballooned, but also the cost of energy for firms, particularly manufacturing firms, steel making firms and so on, that are often in the red wall. There's no price cap for commercial uses of energy. And many of them, their whole viability is being challenged by this conflict as wholesale gas prices spiral. I do think there's going to be a much bigger focus on the military going forward, which is something that we thought wouldn't happen. We haven't had that kind of sense that we need more armed forces since the Berlin Wall collapsed. This is a major change, Alison. This is a milestone in our lives and in history. There will now be big, big changes in the UK. And also, I think, as you rightly say, a lot of the issues of politics that have obsessed many of our colleagues over many years do now melt away into almost comical insignificance, don't they? Mm. (laughs) Of course, the Downing Street party scandals was and is a scandal. Of course, it's upset many, many people. But subjects like that, subjects relating to identity politics, the tittle-tattle of Westminster and virtue signaling, I think certainly for the next few weeks, 
maybe even for the next few months and years, with this return, as you say, of proper real politique. The end of history has ended, to paraphrase Francis Fukuyama. I do think there is all these other pretty much irrelevant issues in terms of the grand scheme of things are going to be blown away. Yeah, I think that Putin probably calculated that the West was too decadent, too weak to do anything except appease him. And we have actually, perhaps surprisingly, dug deep. But I did say in my column this week, I do think that the outbreak of war has shone a pretty unflattering light on our society, particularly on these fashionable obsessions of institutions. And I think that there was a, something that one philosopher, I was really intrigued by this, called the West's luxury values, a certain elite virtue signalling about green renewables when we know and we knew that it was going to cause incredible poverty and hardship to ordinary families. But never mind, because Ursula von der Leyen and all that class of person was firmly behind it. And how stupid Halligan now and self-indulgent do so-called microaggressions look, you know, hurty words, when we actually have the thunderous sound of macroaggressions. There was a story this week, Liam, which you had to laugh. Scottish students in Inverness were given a trigger warning for Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea, because brace yourself, co-pilot. I'm ready. It contains graphic fishing scenes. <laughs> there are kids the same age as those students. We've seen them on the telly, these students with their little goatee beards and their jewellery and the kind of trigger warnings that those young male students are going to be experiencing in the next weeks and months. They're going to be personally featuring in graphic scenes of their own. I think does war lend perspective? Looking forward, Liam, I mean, I know you said earlier that we're not really supposed to talk about whether Russia has a case or not. I think on Planet Normal, we pride ourselves on trying to dig a bit deeper than other outlets. And I do think looking back into the past, what does Russia see in Ukraine? Russia sees Ukraine being used as a bulwark by NATO against itself. We know that America, another great power, has the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine basically says none of America's neighbours are allowed to pose any threat to it with weaponry. We saw, of course, the ultimate expression of that was back in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, we can't possibly defend Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But I'm thinking about a solution now. What's the solution going to be? Will the West have to agree to recognise Crimea and the two breakaway regions in the East and rule out NATO and EU membership for Ukraine in exchange for Russia immediately withdrawing all its troops? I don't know whether President Zelensky would agree to that, but it seems to me that we're going to be circling back to something like those Minsk agreements that you and Con Coughlin discussed so eloquently a couple of weeks ago. I do apologise for interrupting your podcast listening, but I wanted to pop in to tell you about another Telegraph podcast, mine. I'm Christopher Hope, also known as Chopper. And I'm one of the paper's long-standing political reporters and host of a weekly podcast called Chopper's Politics. It's full to the brim with political insight and Westminster gossip recorded from the heart of the action in the Red Lion pub just around the corner from Parliament and Downing Street. Each episode I chat to the movers and shakers in British politics from London Mayor Sadiq Khan to leader of the House of Commons Jacob Rees-Mogg. So pull up a pew and join me for your dose of analysis, news and views on Chopper's politics. Find it wherever you're listening to this podcast. Cheerio! Now this is, Alison, our 90th episode of Planet Normal and few guests have stowed away twice on our rocket of right thinking. Our next guest, though, boards the capsule of common sense for the third time, such is his reputation and authority. Sir Richard Dearlove was head of MI6, the UK's intelligence service, from 1999 to 2004, chair of the trustees of University College London, having previously been master of Pembroke College, Cambridge. He's perhaps the embodiment of the British establishment. And yet, Sir Richard, as Planet Normal regulars know, combines fierce intelligence and huge experience 
with a rather non-establishment characteristic that we cherish, the capacity for independent thought. I started by asking Sir Richard Dearlove if he was surprised that we are where we are when it comes to Russia and Ukraine. I guess I'm very surprised indeed. I think I personally got Putin wrong. I thought that he would do everything except a full invasion and that he would try and grab a bit more of the Donbass region and that you know he would achieve his objectives, which supposedly were to pull Ukraine eastwards to stop them joining NATO without taking the risk of this massive military invasion. I thought he would be more rational and uh, more scheming in the way he developed his position. So I was really, really surprised when this full-scale invasion took place because I thought the cost to Russia in the medium to long term would be unbearably high. And I think I still have that view. You've been in the intelligence business a long time, if I may say so. Can you just put in historic context for us the significance of the likes of Switzerland joining sanctions efforts, the likes of Japan joining sanctions efforts, the European Union sending weapons? Well, I think it's unprecedented where we are in terms of the international reaction. I mean, the most significant event for myself is the change of German policy on defence. I've been a huge critic of Germany for underspending on its contribution to NATO. Uh, Hitherto, it's only been at a level of 1.3% of its GDP, plus the fact that the German military is in a parlous state. A lot of its equipment is mothballed. It really hasn't taken defence policy at all seriously. So for a coalition which is led by an SPD politician to completely turn around on German policy. This is huge because, I mean, bearing in mind that German GDP is massive, 0.678% rise in their defence spending is going to be a massive boost to uh, NATO in the medium to long term. Of course, none of this is going to happen immediately. And I think this is one of the problems with the crisis, the effects of sanctions, the effects of you know these changes, really significant changes in European defence posture will take time to have an effect. But it's maybe the beginning of the end for Putin, but the end may be a very, very long time coming. I was listening to Khodorkovsky being interviewed this morning in London, and he was saying, you know, it could take several years. I mean, to hell, I hope it doesn't. But, you know, we're in an extraordinary position. So Mikhail Khodorkovsky is the former boss of a big Russian oil company called Yukos, who was, of course, jailed by the Russian... Yeah, and then he, when he was released, he fled to the West. He was allowed out eventually, and then he came to London. He's resident in London, and, you know, he must be one of Putin's biggest critics, having been one of his closer allies. But he's been through this, as it were, transformation from one extreme to the other. And I think his comments are very much worth listening to. I think one is sickened by what's actually happening in Ukraine and this massive military column that's now sitting outside Kyiv. I just don't see how the Ukrainians can continue to hold out. So, you know, we are near a devastating denouement. And to take a modern city of three million people with heavy armour and artillery, I mean, it's going to be carnage. What is the best case scenario here, in your view? Well, I mean, the best case scenario, I guess, would be, you know, splitting the Kremlin. There must be significant cracks in the Kremlin, although they're not visible to us yet, which would cause the Russians or the Russian military, I'm thinking of the general staff in particular, to think hard about what's happening and maybe to stand back and for the negotiations that surprisingly took place on the frontier with Belarus to continue and for there to be a ceasefire and some semi-negotiated settlement. I think the problem is that Putin's massively miscalculated. Uh, what's staggering is the ability of the Ukrainian armed forces to withstand this onslaught. But I mean, I don't think that they can continue much longer because the Russians will just use heavy weaponry, which, of course, will create carnage in the civilian population. I don't know if you know anything about these thermobaric weapons, and they suck all the 
oxygen out of the air. And you know, anyone within range of this sort of slow burn, dispersed explosion, it's killed through suffocation. And if they start using that sort of weaponry in an urban situation, my God, I mean, it's terrifying, completely terrifying. I just can't believe that the Russians are really going to go through with this, because even if they capture the capital or they capture Kharkov, I mean, they're going to be faced with a huge insurgency from the population. And that could go on for weeks, it could go on for months, particularly if the West resupplies it. But uh, there are huge problems of resupply as well. I mean, how do you get all these promised weapons into the theatre where they're fighting? I mean, that's if the Russian Air Force is largely in control of the skies. So there are all sorts of factors to think about. We're thinking that Ukraine, of course, is bigger than France and has got a population of almost 50 million. It's a serious piece of territory. It's France and a good chunk of Germany with the population of nearly 50 million. I mean, it's like trying to conquer Spain. And we know what happened when Napoleon tried to do that. And he faced the Spanish guerrilla war. In terms of the geopolitics, you and I have discussed Russia and China getting closer over recent years. Of course, Putin has built oil and now gas pipelines to China to hedge his bets in terms of energy should the West try and sanction Russian energy. Russia and China did a huge energy deal just in early February, on February the 4th, ahead of this invasion. The Chinese say they are partners, not allies with Russia. They're vowing not to interfere with this conflict, but they're not going to put sanctions on, at least that's what Beijing is saying for now. Do you see any cracks appearing in the Russia-China relationship? And how important will that relationship be, Sir Richard, in sustaining Russia's current course of action from the Kremlin's point of view? Well, if China, as it were, continues to be a really important energy purchaser and partner with Russia, of course, that sustains Russia's financial strength. I mean, clearly one of the dangers in this situation for the West in the longer term is that we will drive Russia more closely into the arms of China. However, I mean, the Chinese, they're at an interesting phase. And I think that over the last six to eight months following the takeover in Hong Kong, the security laws in Hong Kong, their behavior in the South China Sea, their rather belligerent comments on Taiwan. But Xi Jinping's drawn back and moderated China's position. I mean, I think this is a subtle judgment, but one that the experts seem to understand and are pretty confident about. I mean, China, I think, takes care or greater care of its international image And for it to be associated too closely with Russia in this venture is going to be incredibly damaging to China as well. So one shouldn't necessarily assume they're going to move in lockstep. And I mean, you've used that phrase, they're partners, not allies. So there's a great deal of uncertainty here. But in the longer term, one is worried that there'll be a Beijing-Moscow axis and that this will be the basis on which the international security system becomes rebalanced, readjusted. It's a pretty disturbing prospect. But I think the Chinese will react with caution and with care because they are have become, I think, more worried about their international image, about their international acceptability. And of course, they are basically one of the world's largest trading nations, which the Russians are certainly not. I mean, the Russians have a one-footed economy, which is based on energy and selling energy. And Europeans, particularly the Germans, have been incredibly unwise in the way that they've developed their energy security in terms of dependence on Russia. And I think we're going to see a huge readjustment now on the energy security issues. So this whole crisis raises so many complex issues and different angles. I was going to come on to energy security, but before I do, I should say, or if I may, that I agree with you in terms of Russia, China. It is a very complex, historically, mutually very suspicious relationship. I know from my own time in Moscow that Russian school children, to this day, their nursery rhymes are sometimes about suspicion towards the Chinese among the Russian population. And two Chinese state banks tellingly have said they're restricting finance for Russian commodity purchases. Let's come on to net zero then, Sir Richard. 
We've seen Germany say it's going to develop its LNG import facilities in order to diversify away from Russian gas, notwithstanding the now two undersea pipelines. They're the joint longest undersea pipelines in the world between St. Petersburg and the north coast of Germany, the so-called Nord Stream pipelines. Do you think that the British government will now rethink? Do you think we will move away from such a fast paced approach to net zero. Do you think, for instance, Sir Richard, that the moratorium on fracking will now be lifted? Do you think it should be lifted? I think that we should immediately lift the moratorium on fracking and that we should follow the advice of the Royal Society, which is that the seismic risk in fracking was not significant enough to stop us. I mean, we have got to become reasonably independent in our ability to produce energy. The rush to net zero is admirable, but it's completely unrealistic. It's totally unrealistic. We've got to reassess the situation. Have ministers been guilty of virtue signalling on this? It's ridiculous. I don't know what's come into the government's head on this because they've just adopted a set of crazy unattainable objectives in terms of the introduction of electric vehicles. It's just not practical. Um, We've got to be much more careful. I, I mean, I applaud the objective, as we all do, to move towards net zero, but we need a policy which is practical and achievable. And of course, you know, gas, particularly the sort of quality gas that the Americans produce through fracking, which has a low sulfur content, is going to be the transfer fuel of the future. And then, in addition, we must develop uh, small modular nuclear reactors. The technology exists. It's what drives nuclear submarines. The Americans uh, are quite advanced in this area. We must invest heavily. And then, you know, we can move sensibly towards zero carbon on the basis of having these small nuclear reactors and using gas. And there are alternative supplies of gas which are going to be available. So the deal of energy blueprint, if I may, is get fracking now, more oil and gas exploration in the North Sea and modular nuclear reactors as soon as possible. Absolutely. And develop our dependence on gas. But then, you know, we've got to have sufficient storage and sufficient supplies What the European powers who are dependent on Russian gas need is a sort of Berlin airlift of gas supplies to Europe as quickly and as fast as possible so that we change the energy equation. Have we been naive? We've been naive. And, you know, the European Union, Merkel in particular, had this sort of benign view of Russia, which has just been completely exploded and knocked on its head. We've got to now reorder our national security priorities, and we have got to change our energy security policy, which is a fundamental part of our national security policy anyway. What will the British Army, Navy and Air Force look like in 10 years, Sir Richard? And to what extent will current events change how it looks? I think current events will change these very significantly. The problem is one of affordability. Global Britain, if that is the model for the future, needs a much, much larger Navy. We're embarking slowly. That program needs to be accelerated. And we will need, as it were, to increase the size of the military and the Air Force. So we're going to have to raise our defence expenditure above whatever it is, 2.2% of GDP. It's going to have to go up above 3% of GDP, in my view. And we have to make sacrifices. I suppose the most controversial thing I can say is our lives seem to be focused on the National Health Service, understandably in the aftermath of a pandemic. But we have to give equivalent weight in other areas of expenditure. And probably the most urgent now is a degree of re-equipment and rearmament in our armed forces. And I think the Navy should come first. Final question, Sir Richard. I have to ask you this because many of our Planet Normal listeners have emailed us about it. The current head of MI6, your successor, Richard Moore, tweeted as the invasion of Ukraine was happening, with the tragedy and destruction unfolding in Ukraine, let us resume our series of tweets to mark LGBT History Month. Is this the sort of thing that the head of British intelligence should be tweeting? What does it achieve? Well, I'm personally 
disappointed in the timing of that tweet and how it came out. Look, I don't like to talk about my time in the service, but I mean, we made huge steps in this general direction inside the service. And I was very proud of the progress the service made. But it's an intelligence service. It has massive preoccupations during an international crisis. This is not an area where the intelligence community should be leading. It should just get on with its policies quietly and focus ultimately on its most important issues. Let me read the whole tweet, Sir Richard, in fairness. I don't think it's fair if I don't read the whole tweet under these circumstances. With the tragedy and destruction unfolding so distressingly in Ukraine, we should remember the values and hard-won freedoms that distinguish us from Putin, none more than LGBT plus rights. So let us resume our series of tweets to mark LGBT History Month 2022. That's the full tweet. Personally, I wouldn't be tweeting if I was still head of the service. And I certainly wouldn't have, as it were, added the last phrase. But, you know, I don't want to be seen as a sort of uh, someone who is in any way opposed to the sentiment of the tweet. I just think the timing was unfortunate and unnecessary and exposes the service to criticism that you've received from your readers. You know, in a crisis, one should focus on the crisis and and get on with that. And the service internally, its personnel policies, can achieve all the things that are expressed in that tweet without having to advertise the fact publicly. Sir Richard Dearlove, thanks so much for joining us here on Planet Normal. Okay, Liam, it's a pleasure to talk to you and important to do so in this extreme moment of crisis. Wow, as a co-pilot, there's a few quietly diplomatic bombshells, aren't there? Get fracking and drilling, increase the size of our military, stop giving so much money to the NHS and boost the size of our pathetic Navy, raise defence spending. Germany has been terrible lack of contribution to NATO. Suddenly this massive wake-up call. They were coming thick and fast, co-pilot, weren't they? It was like a sort of 1954 edition of Eagle magazine or something. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> it's always a joy, privately and on Planet Normal, to have the benefit of Richard Dearlove's immense wisdom. He spent a big part of his career as a spy behind the Iron Curtain when, as you know, Liam, the stakes were incredibly high. And I like to think of him having a whiskey with George Smiley, played by Alec Guinness. But I just think that was extraordinary stuff he said. And even he said, wasn't he, that he was shocked that Putin had gone so far? He certainly was shocked. Sir Richard Dearlove is really one of our most qualified Russia watchers, if you like. He's spent a great deal of time in the country. He has very, very serious intelligence contacts to this day and academic contacts, and he's always worth listening to. And I think it just goes to show how surprised a lot of professional Russia watchers are about what has happened. And as I say, the time for nuanced, learned, on the one hand, on the other, discussion about how we can solve this Russia-Ukraine conflict, you know, along the lines of the Minsk agreements that you talked about early in 2014, 2015, a degree of autonomy for Donbass and Luhansk, the part of Ukraine closest to Russia, the part where there are so many ethnic Russians who have felt over the years that West Ukraine hasn't respected their language, their ethnicity, their rights. They could have been given some degree of autonomy within the construct of the Ukrainian nation, so not annexing them or splitting up the nation. And that would have potentially been enough to solve this agreement as the French and the Germans tried to convey before this invasion. But the time for those nuances isn't now. What we need now is just an end to this destruction and humanitarian fallout. And I do believe strongly that the reason Putin will eventually stop this will be because of the economic pain that the West is going to impose on the Russian people. But be in no doubt, Alison, yes, we want Ukrainians to be okay. Yes, we want this war to end, the most serious war we've seen on the continent of Europe since we last heard those 
incredible sirens, but that is going to cost us economically too as fuel prices go up if there's a big asset price collapse around the world sparked by a collapse in Russia. It's happened before. It happened in 1998. If people's retirement portfolios are seriously dented as those asset prices, stocks and bonds fall. So the stakes are, of course, very, very high for Vladimir Putin. They couldn't be higher for ordinary men and women in Ukraine. But the stakes here, Alison, in a different way, are pretty high too. Let's cut to the chase, Liam. I think Boris is going to have to pluck up courage and go upstairs and tell Carrie that net zero is cancelled for the foreseeable future. (laughs) And I do think he's shown some backbone over Ukraine, but I think he's probably slightly more scared of her indoors than he is of the Russian president. Now on to our listener emails. Understandably, we've had a lot of correspondence this week about the situation in Ukraine with a lot of listeners and Telegraph readers, Liam, being pro taking more actual physical action than we have. Bill says, so this is civilization standing by and letting innocents get slaughtered and even worse, some defending that slaughter. We are so spoiled in the West that I'm not sure we would fight for our own country. However, I did hear that Justin Trudeau has launched the ultimate weapon against Putin. He has unfriended him on Facebook. The war is almost over. Sue criticises a lot of armchair generals demanding the West intervene militarily. If you are not prepared to send your own children to fight for Ukraine, please stop demanding someone else send theirs. And finally, this is really interesting, Liam. Kevin says, The training I have been forced to undertake in recent years would not help if we are invaded. I do have LGBT FAQ plus equality training. I do have white privilege training. I have attended a mindfulness workshop, but I do not know how to make a Molotov cocktail, fire a machine gun or launch an anti-tank missile. I actually believed in that training at the time, but it will all be worthless if I can't man up and defend my own country. Well said, Kevin. This is from someone, Alison, that we'll call Cheryl to protect her identity, and Cheryl's a nurse. Dear Alison and Liam, it would be wonderful if you could arrange that in-person Planet Normal event. This is something we mentioned in passing last week, isn't it, Alison, that we're thinking of hosting a live event for our 100th Planet Normal in 10 weeks' time. Amazing enthusiasm, Halligan, for this event. A tsunami of emails we had just on a tiny little flicker, a little show of ankle that we would have a live event. So thanks so much for Planet Normal listeners. If you are enthusiastic about that, do email us and tell us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk and that will help us to get that event off the ground so Planet Normal citizens could meet. But back to Cheryl's email, she said that would be lovely if we could meet in person. She then wrote... I've listened right from the start of your podcast and just to be in the same room with like-minded people would be a breath of fresh air. On another note, writes Cheryl, it is good to see people out and about, although my work situation, she is a nurse, as I said, remains every bit as depressing as before with the NHS embracing this remote way of treating patients. There's little empathy for patients or family and sadly, none of us frontline workers. The managers continue to work from home, dictating policy that alienates us further from those we're caring for. I've personally refused to comply with the no visitor or companion rule, and that's resulted in numerous arguments. It's heartbreaking to have oncology patients alone trying to understand what's happening and not being allowed companions for comfort. Thanks for all the sensible podcasts over the last year. Regards, Cheryl. And as I say, that's not her real name. Well, Liam, it's really good, isn't it, to hear from doctors and nurses who are defying these really inhumane dictates. Let, let's remind ourselves that we've come, we've lifted all the COVID restrictions and we've still got a one parent rule for parents going to hear if their child has cancer and only the mum or the dad allowed to be present. So on Planet Normal, we are really, really wanting those restrictions to be lifted. Now, we've had a huge amount of correspondence this week, as I said, from people about the horrifying rising fuel bills. Gary says, 
I manage my 83-year-old mother's energy bill and her fixed tariff has just ended. Scottish Power are increasing her monthly payment from £58.79 to £256.76. Yes, more than 437%. Is this a record or can anyone best its disgraceful increase? Just saying, Alison, that's three grand a year. That's £3,000 a year for Gary's mum. I know, it's insane. And we know also people like my mother of a similar age, extremely careful, watchful about what they spend and probably start turning the thermostat down, worrying about not being able to pay these stupendous bills. And we're going to see old people freezing, Liam. Really a huge national crisis brewing. Claire says... I'm forwarding you an email from my energy supply, Octopus. Last Thursday, the household participated in the great turndown challenge instigated by Octopus. They worked out how much electricity we usually use between 4.30 and 6.30 p.m. and set us a target amount to reduce by. We spent the day getting ready. We charged laptops, cooked the dinner early, turned off lights and generally pushed our usage to other parts of the day. At the allotted hour, the Casey's sat in the Stygian gloom, drinking water. (laughs) The children revised for their GCSEs on their laptops. We also turned the gas central heating down due to a slight misunderstanding between the adults. I have that frequently in my home, Claire. Thermostat wars. It was thoroughly miserable, Claire says, but we kept at it for the common good. It turns out that we use 75% less energy than we would normally use. And as a reward, we would be credited with 0.20 pounds. Yes, that's 20p. I spent quite a lot of time yesterday wondering about the 20p and the two hours my family spent earning it. I opened the Telegraph today and found an article by Olivia Rudgard on Net Zero. The article says that the government has no reliable idea of how much the drive for Net Zero will cost the nation. It has no clear plan and it's probably overestimating consumer willingness to switch to heat pumps and electric cars. It has no reliable estimate of the process of implementation. This is more than concerning. I'm happy to turn off lights in an empty room and run appliances at night within reason. I'll even put on another jumper when it's cold. But from what I have just experienced, that will not be enough. Carrie Johnson and Zach Goldsmith may see it differently, but then their circumstances are very different from the vast majority of the population. Liam, I have read your articles. My goodness, Claire, that's going the extra mile. More than you do, (laughs) Alison. So I know that you are all over the cost of living arguments. That's quite right about the co-pilot. So I won't rehash it all again, other than to say we need more honesty about it and why net zero is important, but how are we going to get there? This isn't a debate where, yet again, we can be told that we hold the wrong opinions and that we just don't understand. I appreciate that the coming week's podcast may be on war and the plight of the Ukrainian people, but please could you talk about energy? Great email. David wrote to us, Alison, a planet normal do? Brilliant. Yes, please. I feel it's a great privilege to be one of the early settlers on planet normal, says David, with every episode under my belt. Can I ask you, Liam and Alison, king and queen of our tribe, to create a special award for George, who's behaved with so much courage in order to furnish us with the truth instead of spin? Perhaps chief medical advisor would suit well. Also, lifetime awards created for the founders of the Great Barrington Declaration, Dr. Sinetra Gupta, Dr. Martin Koldorf and Dr. J. Bhattacharya. With very best wishes to you both. Where will we be without you guys? Planetless. Well, that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week. Alison, it's you. I think it's got to be Claire with her tale of the family trying to cut back on power and saving 20p. Stirring example to us all, Claire. So, Claire, write to us at planetnormaltelegraph.co.uk with the subject heading in your email, mug winner, and give us your address and the Planet Normal team will make sure a rare as rocking horse teeth Planet Normal mug is winging its way to you. If you enjoy Planet Normal, do leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps others to find us. And we will, of course, be publishing more exciting information about our event in the middle of May. Do keep emailing us. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, 
And the madness of planet Earth comes back into view thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampett, our editor, Zoe Hitch. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. 